This is Listen St. Louis with Carol Daniel. When I think about the critical issues facing black and brown residents in the St. Louis area, I often ask the questions, how did we get here? What's holding us back? And how do we progress? At 9 PBS, we want to deepen our understanding and change the narrative. Join me as I look for answers and discover solutions on today's podcast. Despite the presence of world-class healthcare facilities and research in St. Louis, why are there barriers for black and brown St. Louisans to achieve optimal health? What can the Director of Health for the City of St. Louis do about it? And as an internationally renowned infectious diseases physician, what did she learn about health equity during the coronavirus pandemic? My guest today, Dr. Maddie Hatswayo Davis. Listen St. Louis with Carol Daniel is supported in part by Midwest Bank Center, the Betsy and Thomas Patterson Foundation, and Orvin and Latrice Kimbro. Welcome back to another episode of Listen St. Louis with Carol Daniel. Thank you so much for listening, St. Louis. Thank you for downloading. Thank you for sharing. And thank you for your comments. So again, do download, do share, and do subscribe because we want more people to know about this podcast. And to our subscribers, special content just for you, certainly in 2024. Welcome again. I have such a special guest today. I was so nervous to talk to her because she's such an important part of this community. She is the health director for the city of St. Louis, Dr. Mari Hashwayo Davis. Dr. Mari, Dr. Davis, girlfriend, my friend, I am so happy that you are in the studio. I'm so honored. And everybody uses that word so much. But for me, it is an honor because it's you, because of who you are, mm. because of um, really being in the presence of a living legend. Oh. Um, and what really um, strikes me about you is that for all your accolades, for the respect that you have earned in our community, how accessible you make yourself, how you take people like me under your wing. Mm. You know, at, I, I remember the day we got the call at the health department that the Carol Daniel was going to have me on her show. And I'll let you know that my comms team never gets shook, never gets excited. But that was a day for them because mm. of who you are to them. Oh my. So it's just been beautiful to watch you get your flowers over the last couple of years. It was really special over the last couple of months to see the community shower you mm. with your flowers. And so I just want to give you that before we start. She's trying to make me cry <laughs> and we are not even three minutes in. You meet some people and there is an instant connection, instant respect and instant curiosity because I wanted to know who, wow, who is she? How did she get here? Well, it's a story. You got some time? It, I do. Ha you, you have less time than I do, but I definitely, your journey is so amazing. And you came to St. Louis to the position during the pandemic. So walk us through in the limited time we have how you came to be the director of the St. Louis Health Department. Well, that story has to start with my mother. Mm. You know, my mother is the heroine of my story. To be raised by a single mother from what you all would call a low income country, what people used to call a third world country, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that country is? Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. To be classified technically as growing up lower middle class, right? Um, there's nothing about my origins that should have me sitting in front of the Carol Daniels on a Monday morning mm. as a health director for one of, you know, for a large city in the United States. And yet here I am. And it, it, it is her passion, her tenacity, her faith, really her faith. My mother is a, is a deep woman of faith, wasn't always so, but grew in her faith as sh she was trying to figure out how to raise three young girls. Um, but I think my origin story is, is, is important because when I think about my justice almost to a fault centered, um, I don't know, the, the, the pillar on which I, I stand, the way that I think about health equity, the way that I think about justice on behalf of our people mm -hmm. and our community, the way I unapologetically lead on behalf 
of that. It has to be. You know, my dad fought for independence for our country from British colonialists. Mm. He was plucked out of his village as a young adolescent. Um, Nothing about being that age should have you training to fight a a, a civil war, Mm -hmm. a war for independence. And um, in 1980, when he came back and, and was one of the many brave men and women who won that war on behalf of our people met my gorgeous mom, you know, and and they got to raise a family in newly independent Zimbabwe, brimming with hope. And part of the center of that from at least my mother was education. And she she told us the only way out of poverty, the only way out of or avoiding any sort of life that we didn't want was through education. So we got a library card with our first bicycle. You know what I mean? Oh, we, I love it. We, my mom busted her behind uh, to make sure we were able to go to private schools. Because unlike here in this country where you can have very privileged political debates about the importance of public versus private school, in my country it's very simple. Private means better. You know, public means lesser than and a, and a lower quality of education. And so... It was that foundation that really set me up for success. Um, I would say past that, the death of my father when I was 15 um, really put, put that, that seed for medicine um, because we were not close. He, you know, he was a war veteran. And so PTSD, which wasn't a phrase then. He just wasn't equipped, Carol. Right. He wasn't equipped to right. be a husband or a father. Um, and it's painful because I, every time I meet people, oh, your father was the nicest man, the kindest man, the most giving man. It just wasn't completely my experience. And yeah. I know him to be those things, but I just know that he didn't have the tools um, because he was a war veteran yeah. who had been gone for most of his like young adult life, right. you know, his formative um, years on the battlefield. That's it. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, in, in countries like mine, there is no Medicaid, Medicare. There is no um, there isn't even words in our language for PTSD, depression or anxiety. So he did the best he could. Um, but that that best didn't involve him being a present husband or father, right. you know, and, and watching his medical, physical, emotional struggles shifted you to medicine, drove you to medicine. For sure. That and the fact that I wasn't there physically when he passed. You know, he asked the president to send him out of the country on an international assignment. And part of that, I think, was to make sure he had good medical care. And part of that is he didn't want anyone to know he was sick. So I wasn't there for the passing. My mom tried to rush us there once we were made aware that he... um, he was in his last days. And the guilt from that as a young teen mm. consumes you. And so the only thing I held on to is, wow, I hope his medical team were good people. And a lot of times when you think about doctors, you think about smart people. You think about, you know, brilliance. Right, right. For me, it was always, I hope they're kind. I hope they made him feel loved and comfortable. That's how I processed it with my young mind. And that's a rare way in which to process yeah. it as a 15-year-old. But it's the kind of physician I am, right? Mm-hmm. What what makes me who I am, and, and I fought it for so long because, again, in academics, what's valued is people who can take tests, who can, right. you know, are top of their line. For me, I'm just, I make myself accessible. I love making people feel comfortable. I love making people feel like they can open up in their in their darkest moments. I use, and that's called a soft skill. You know, that's the micro right. and macro aggression in mm-hmm. academics is that that skill isn't as important as being able to take a standardized test, which is such a fallacy, right? Um, but it that's really a lot is. of who I am and mm-hmm. how I am. So I, m- my best compliments are the compliment that you led with, right, is I just like to be down to earth, yeah. accessible. I'm the doctor that gives you a hug, who makes you feel comfortable telling me your the the most the hardest truths so that we can get to the bottom of how we can provide you with the tools to not just live but thrive. So you are caring and you are compassionate and you are accessible and you are a warrior really uh, for your people, which I also uh, adore and respect. Um, but you are also smart. <laughs> Say that, Carol. You are also Let's brilliant. Let's be very clear. Let's be very clear, right? It's, it's not easy. You know this. You're mm-hmm. a black woman in mm-hmm. journalism. In right? a male-dominated in field. In a male-dominated field. And so, the seeming they all are, other than teaching. <laughs> but but when you think about what you had yeah. to go through, I, I that's it's a similar pathway. Mm-hmm. You know, coming here, being not just black, but a black woman, not just being a black woman, but a black woman immigrant. Um, there's th- that intersectionality 
can make it hard. You know, I went to I was blessed to go to leading institutions for uh, my my medical training and my fellowship training. But that often means tokenism. It means you're one of the only, if not the only person of color. I was certainly the only black woman when I started my um, physician role past training. Um, and there weren't a lot of people who cared about the things that I cared about. Um, and not a lot of... V- not a lot of role models, if I'm being very honest. Mm-hmm. And that's not to take away from anyone. But, you know, I knew and I was never I never lied about the fact that I wanted to be in public health, that I cared about community engagement, that I cared about health disparities. But it was tough because when you don't see those role models, you feel pressure to be something you're not. And then also that those are discounted fields. That's right. And and not just fields, but the people, because health disparities is a, is a is terminology. Mm-hmm. But there are individual lives, as you would know, as you well know, and have practiced, individual lives behind every disparity. And we are, for, no matter what the metric, we suffer as African Americans. We, we are suffering greatly. Gosh. Why did you choose infectious diseases? diseases? Um, when I was a teenager, my great aunt, a matriarch of our family, passed away. And funerals in my culture are typically celebratory events, much like weddings. They're beautiful. It's kind of like a family reunion, and um, they're vibrant, and you, you, they're singing, and there's eating, and there's drinking, and there's introductions of family lines. Um, this one just felt muted. It mm. felt heavy. It felt um, like it should be a secret. It was my first interaction with stigma. Mm. And as an adult came to find out that this brilliant, beautiful woman who had lived her life with integrity, married her husband as a virgin, you know, and because of his indiscretions in their marriage, he brought HIV Mm. um, and she died of the complications of AIDS. And um, so that funeral was my first time experiencing stigma. Did you know it? How old were you then? And did you? I was about 15. So I didn't know it at the time. So you, wait, wait. Sorry, sorry. No, because it was around the time my dad died. So I'd say there's about a two year gap either way. But still, what what I'm processing, what we're all processing, listening and and watching is that you are not even 18 and you have lost your father and the matriarch of the family, your, your aunt. And it was devastating for me as a young woman, you know, as as because um, she was a role model. Right. And so that was my interaction. It was a very personal interaction mm-hmm. with HIV. And so for me, it wasn't all it wasn't just medicine. It was also always going to be medicine and specifically infectious diseases. And the plan was always to go home. The plan was to come here, benefit from this world class education. Mm-hmm. Um, but I knew I needed a public health degree, too, because when you grow up in the places I grew up, it's not you can't just be clinically excellent, right? Everything is tied to socioeconomics and public health, quite frankly. Um, but you make plans and, and God laughs. And right. I met my brilliant, beautiful husband in medical school. I love how you talk about um, him. Because I, I, I talk about my husband the same way as you But well I do know. it mostly to, to, to irk him because he gets so <laughs> embarrassed. And so if he's in the crowd when I'm talking about him, I call him a hunk because I know that gets under his skin. But he is. I mean, you know. And you have uh, beautiful children. and So blessed. Yes. So yes. blessed. But that was that was infectious diseases for okay. me. There's always going to be infectious diseases. So, and in St. Louis... You become the health director, and and I don't want to go back and forth and jump around at all, um, but I, I have to hear from you what it was like to come to this position during the pandemic early on. Excuse me, we, we only see Caucasian faces, and I remember on social media, we're all trying to figure out, the shutdown happens, we're trying to figure out what this is and how long this is going to be in our lives national, globally. Mm-hmm. And I remember reading on social media, people thinking, you know, the white people are dying and we don't realize that it is us. Mm-hmm. We don't realize this. And then you become the health director of a still majority black city. And I mean, that doesn't happen if we don't have the first black female mayor for the city of St. Louis. So let's be clear. Let's be clear about why representation matters. Let's be clear about why black leadership matters Mm -hmm. is because oftentimes those tables are not meant for us and we don't get a seat at that table. And so what I've loved about the evolution of leadership, the the, the places you occupy, right, Mm -hmm. is you built the seat 
Literally, mm -hmm. yeah. you built the seat mm -hmm. and now you get to choose who you bring to the table. Mm -hmm. You brought me today. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. what the Honorable Mayor Tashara Jones did in my case. And I was coming out of a really hard place. You know, academics, I was not thriving. I was not mentored and sponsored with intention. I was not told that my skill set was as valuable than that of my predominantly white peers. I was not told that the work of public health, community engagement, and health disparities was as valuable, right, as the or work of... And necessary. Or as necessary as the work of basic sciences, clinical research. And let me be clear, those things are essential. But what is billions of dollars in research if we can't implement it? What is billions of dollars in um, being able to develop medication if we cannot compel people to take a pill, right? right? And so while I believe that the work of my colleagues in academics was important, mine was too. And it was a disservice to be the only black woman in my division and to struggle the way I do, to self-advocate for what felt like crumbs at the time mm -hmm. and to be overseen. So I left in self-advocacy. I resigned. And you believe your career is over. Nobody leaves the big, you know, the big hospitals and 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 their career lives to tell about it, you know, but God. But right, for but the God. fact mm -hmm. that I had been in community on my own personal time, Right. That no, even though that never made it to a formal evaluation, all of the talks, all of the education, the committees and showing up in community since I was a fellow. But what that meant was community leaders began to know who I am. Mm -hmm. They began to value. And they're the ones who went to the mayor and said, her, we want her. Mm -hmm. And so at one of my lowest times when I didn't know what my next steps would be and if my career would be OK, unbeknownst to me, people were mm. saying my name. And so when she called, I said yes. And four months after resigning, I became the health director for the city of St. Louis. And um, there's a couple of other stories that are happening, right? Because we talk about the beginning of the pandemic, but we forget the stories of racial injustice that were happening right. in that same year, mm -hmm. right? I mm -hmm. was pregnant, uh, you know, as an infectious diseases doc, going through my own things in my profession, but also having a baby, at the beginning of the, tra uh, the, the, the the pandemic, my beautiful baby Naniso came in May of 2020. And um, two weeks after she was born, George Floyd was murdered. Mm. And Carol, I'm in lockdown, much like the other country, on right. maternity leave. You know, a male colleague liked to call it vacation. Ain't, ain't that something? <laughs> All right, I'm sorry. Ain't that something, mm. girl? Yeah. Anyway. That's like, a whole don't, nother don't hour. Get, don't get me started <laughs> on that, right? So Y'all stop I, it. Come on, man. Please stop. So I'm breastfeeding every two hours mm. with a newborn, a three-year-old in the house. The, the world is on lockdown, so my mother couldn't be with me. His parents couldn't support us. We're doing this by ourselves, and then George Floyd is murdered. I didn't have the mental capacity to process another death at the hands of the police. I didn't have the capacity to watch a video of a black man calling out for his mother yeah. before he was murdered in broad daylight. I couldn't do it as a new mother, right? Mm -hmm. So I had to wait a couple of weeks. And I remember I just breastfed our baby. I put her in the bassinet. Jesse was snoring peacefully next to me. And I finally said, okay, put the headphones on and I watched mm. the video and I wept. Mm. But it was a catalyst. Right. So again, it's not just, oh, you were the health director in the pandemic. It's you're going through it at your job, like a lot of people of color. For sure. It's our community is being hit with another. This is acute on chronic trauma for our community. So let's tell the story in its fullness. Let's keep it all the way real, right? right? right. Because, you know, when, when, when it's why is she so angry, why, why, the angry black woman trope. Right, right. It's because some days... I'm dealing with angry. all those storylines right. at the same time. I'm tired of y'all. <laughs> tired. I'm tired of it. it. So I have to give credit to the black community leaders who saw enough in me to raise my career up from the ashes. I have to give credit to a mayor who sat me in that seat. And I didn't have the luxury because by the time I came, October of 2021, we'd been in it for over right. a year and a half. And we by then knew. Right. Yeah. So I, I didn't have the luxury to just lead for covid we had let go of almost every other health condition. People weren't making it to doctor's visits, right? So hypertension, diabetes, nearly every other part of, of health care had gone to the wayside. So it was a big, big role to and, step into. And what does your 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 training and everything you were doing on your personal time, because I did peep that, mm -hmm. uh, what does it tell you and please tell us one of the questions that we ask on Listen St. Louis is how did we get here? 
And I've often wanted to put up a billboard that that just says this is not who we were. Mm. Like we weren't always obese. We weren't always facing hypertension. We weren't always facing death, being diagnosed later than whether it's autism or breast cancer. We weren't always in those positions. We weren't always in those facing that circumstance. It's intentional Mm. and it's willful Mm. and it dates back to slavery Mm. when the bodies of black men and women were used without their consent for atrocities, right? There is documented historical and current events that set the scene for disparities. And for me, it was the frustration at the righteous indignation of people being so shocked at the statistics that we saw at the beginning of COVID, right? Where Black and brown people, uh, and and I mean black, Latin, X, um, Asian and Pacific Islander co- uh, populations were three to four times more likely to get COVID, three f- to four times more likely to be on a ventilator, and three times more likely to die. And that wasn't a shock to any of us who do this work. Right. We weren't surprised by that. Why? Because you can take those statistics and put right, it into and on a any, range yeah. and you can plug it into high blood pressure, diabetes, mm-hmm. most cancers, all cause mortality. So this has been happening. Right. So for me, it was it was my time. Right. Because when do you get a black woman immigrant who is an infectious diseases physician who has trained at some of the top institutions of the country, who, by the way, is passionate about public health, community engagement and health disparities and a global pandemic came. And every time I switched the TV on, all I saw was old white men speaking on our behalf. I didn't even see ID people. If I'm being honest, I didn't see people in infectious diseases other than Dr. Fauci. So I became the representation I did not see. I spoke truth to power. Do you know what I mean? Yes. And, and I, I, my, one of my superpowers is being able to take really complex issues right. and, and make them accessible. Mm-hmm. I can speak in the plane and still tell you what you need to know about your health. Because that's another thing that, that we do in medicine. Oh, doctors, we just love to put on our white coats and walk the halls with our teams and think that we can talk at a much higher level than anybody. And, 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 and if you do that long enough, you don't trust that the people that you serve that are in these hospital beds can understand mm-hmm. because you've been to school for all these years, right? So you don't even break it down. Do because you see what you, I'm saying? Yes, yes. All yeah. of that is accessible. And you mm-hmm. aren't your way to in, in anything if you don't know how to make it accessible. That's the argument I make. So for me, it was a calling, but it was my self-advocacy and it was time for us to speak on behalf of our people. So when you asked me, how did we get there? It was through willful neglect. It was through systemic and structural racism. It was through social and structural determinants of health that compound on communities Mm -hmm. that have not been put in a position to thrive like other communities, which is why leading unapologetically with health equity is something I do and have always done. There's a part of me that wants to just like flip this (laughs) flip this table because uh, I hear you, and I have I've read it, I've said it, and you, and like you said, we have talked many occasions, and we know it to be true. And yet, and yet, and yet, I mean, people roll their eyes at Tuskegee. People say Tuskegee right. is such so a played long out example. Ago. I worked at the John Cochran VA two mm-hmm. years ago. Every day. Do you understand mm-hmm. me? Yes. I had our nation's veterans, men and women, who fought for this country bravely in tears in beds when a, even a black doctor would come to a black patient in the VA and say, I need you to take this therapy. They don't trust us. I would speak to family members who would say, it took everything for me to get mom and dad out the house. They don't right. trust these institutions. And why should they? And when we talk about Tuskegee, we think it's so played out, but you realize that the descendants of people in Tuskegee are alive today. Right. That certain people that were actually in those experiments are, yeah. Some of them still live. Right. When you talk about their wives who were impacted, the, the babies born with congenital syphilis, and you ask me if that wouldn't have a long-term, deep-rooted impact mm-hmm. on how you see the world. And that's just one example of the historic and current um, incidences, atrocities that have happened within community. So, for example, when people talked about vaccine hesitancy, I, I really despise that term. I find Why? it very disrespectful because there's nothing hesitant Right. about what communities of colors have faced when they look at health or science or even government institutions. Right. So I call it vaccine confidence. And I term it a lack of vaccine confidence because the onus is then on me 
That's my job. As a health if provider, you, health professional. As a health provider and a health mm-hmm. professional and mm-hmm. a leader, if I haven't instilled that confidence in you, that's on me. And what am I doing better to lead? And so, America, <laughs> you have not instilled confidence in an entire population that's of, right. of, of people. That's Con- right. In, 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 in anything. That's right. I, I remember um, the former... Um, state's attorney in St. Clair County saying to me, and I promise you, Dr. Davis, this was 15 years ago, saying to me that we are dealing with a generation, and he said the word generation, but generations, I would say, who have no faith in any institution. And he was in law enforcement and felt the need to try to instill confidence in law enforcement. Now, you're, you're not a police officer, neither am I. But that is one institution. So law enforcement, which is the courts, justice, the justice system, health care, education, every major institution, America, has failed us. Mm-hmm. And now you want me to and I did and I did get the vaccine because my mother and my late father um, were elderly in a nursing home. That's right. And so I did get the vaccine. But again, people hear some of the terms that I'm talking about and it and it politicized. It's become so politicized right. that they make assumptions. Let me be very clear. I now work for a government institution. I have a government title. Right. People don't trust me. But that doesn't threaten me and it doesn't make me try to distract myself with these political arguments. I don't care. I believe the left and the right failed us. Mm. I believe that they over politicized Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. COVID and they made it so Mm -hmm. people didn't trust the words of people who were trained to. Carol, let me tell you something. If, If the plumbing breaks in my house, what do I look like calling a plumber and then arguing with them about how to fix my plumbing? I am a highly educated person. I have a lot of degrees. They are all over my wall right now, sis. (laughs) And if I go to my daughter's school, I did not go to school to be a teacher or to study education. What do I look like arguing with them about every part of their educational system? Yet, we normalize that in COVID. Right. Physicians, infectious diseases, doctors, we became the enemy. And politicians, some of whom hadn't even passed high school biology with right. a C mm-hmm. became mm-hmm. who people went to. Yeah. And I don't begrudge With an people. agenda. Yeah. With an agenda. With an agenda on both sides. Yes. Right? And, there, and there, there remains an agenda. And I have said this often and I will continue to say this and, and question people about it that there is a power grab. There has always been a power grab and the use of fear is very productive for and those who want very to. Very productive. Think. And again, I'm not going to use a scapegoat. I believe the medical community was terrible in communicating. It was one of the reasons I came to the fore. Yeah. You should not be in front of a mic. You should not be on a TV um, if you do not know how to speak to people. And, and, and to try to oversimplify, to try to make a message monolithic. As an infectious diseases doctor, I can tell you that everything about viruses and bacteria is not a monolith. It's not one size fits all. Mm. They change. They evolve every day. Right, right. You talk about strains. There have been hundreds of strains of COVID. We don't even report on most of them because it's just a normal part of, of virology. Right. We should have been honest about that because if you teach people that from the get-go, right. then people's expectations are, oh, okay, then the recommendations should we'll evolve change. too. Right. right, right, right. So we lost the, 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 the public's trust because we didn't, we were quite frankly um, vain maybe, or maybe we I- just- Ill-equipped? Uh, Ill- I don't know. I don't know if we had enough respect mm. for the fact that the development of, vac- of a vaccine is equally as important as communication. And we messed that up. So you mentioned the terminology health equity, and I know that people bristle when they mm. hear the term equity, mm-hmm. period. Uh, but what, wh- how does that, what is that as it pertains to the black community? So health equity for me is very simple. If we go to a baseball game. We want to all be able to watch the game, mm-hmm. enjoy the game, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. If someone is sitting or at a seat or even outside the stadium and they can't even watch the game because there's a fence that's blocking them, they don't get to enjoy the game. Simplistically, that's what healthcare has been like for many communities. Right. There are people who are inside the stadium, have great seats, see the game, enjoy it, and, 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 and are thriving. But then there are people who don't even get to see the game, 
right? Mm -hmm. And so we tried to fix it with equality. And equality said, well, if we give resources to everybody, the same level of resources to everybody, then even the people in the stadium get something and the people in the stadium don't. But that's compromising in many ways. And especially if you don't allocate the right amount of resources, the people outside get a little leg up. Yeah. But what I saw during the equality phase of this is that they still weren't able to, to peep over that fence and enjoy the game. Mm -hmm. What I want is liberation for everybody. I don't care what community you're from. I, I don't think so, I've ever heard liberation and health care. Oh, yeah. For yeah. me, the two are very yeah. much linked, right? I want liberation for everybody. I know what it's like for people to say, I just want to watch a Sunday game without somebody, you know, taking a knee. I just want to enjoy stuff without it being heavy. That's great. I do, too. That's a privilege, though. Yes, it is. That's a privilege that I have. Miss, Miss Carol, that you have mm -hmm. and that many people have, but that's not a privilege that everybody else gets, right? So for me in healthcare, it's about unapologetically disproportionately providing resources to communities that have disproportionately right. been negatively impacted. So if your disproportionate impact is great, then the resources that should we should be. provide you and the, and, and, and the support should be mm -hmm. great. And if you were good, then... You're good. You're good. You're good. You're good. Right? I, I have to then raise the specter of of, of compassion, mm -hmm. which I know is a word that we are using a lot now. Mm -hmm. And some people don't care about it and don't even know what it looks like mm -hmm. when we talk about equity and equality. Mm -hmm. But I would say, and I've told this story before, that if you say you care about babies, then when you hear that black babies in the city are three times mm -hmm. more likely to die, not reach their first birthday, mm -hmm. then uh, full stop. That's it. That's something we should all care about. We should all care we about. We should all want to make sure that they're okay. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes. And so I know that this is jarring for a lot of people, but it's just very simple for me. And um, I'm at the stage in my career where I have the research to back it up. I have a full epidemiology team that provides me the data to back it up. And that is how the health department moves. We make priorities. We make sure to understand where the most vulnerable populations are and newsflash. And if it's a newsflash for you, mm -hmm. you need to stay more linked to right. what's going on around you. It is always North City over and over and over right. again. It is always parts of South City, right? It is always of pockets of communities around um, the, the central city that have the same level of disparities over and over again. And it's not just COVID. Within the pandemic, we saw crises that were crises before the pandemic increase, right? Violence prevention work, right. mental health, mm -hmm. maternal mm -hmm. child health. And what is the connection in your office between mental well-being and overall health care. Mental well-being is health care. So what's, the, what's the connection It is my main you? priority as we transition from a pandemic to endemic uh, state within our city is behavioral health. I was shocked and appalled at how our health department had been deprioritized over years and years and years. Along with every health department in the country. Across, this yeah. is a this is an actual emergency, yeah. right? We just coming out of a pandemic, so you would think that everybody would be like, public health should get some prioritization. Yeah. Yet and still, I would lead in a state that in 2021 was 50th out of 50th. We are the bottom state in the country for per capita spending on public health. We believe $7 per capita. Each person's life is worth $7 in this state. Oh, then okay. I lead a health department in a city where the mayor and I inherited 1% of the budget towards the public health department, right? I have a health department that's a quarter the size it should be for a city, a city this size. And the budget is appalling for it, right? And so I walk in and I'm like, okay, I know what the mayor's priorities are. She's made them very clear to me. I know they align with my priorities. So let me talk to the people who are doing the work of behavioral health. And then I find out there isn't even one person employed to do the work of behavioral health in my health department, Carol. Day one. Really? We exclusively contract or subcontract out. So now let's talk business for okay. a minute. If you start your own business, you're the president and CEO, right? Is it a better business model if you know what your vision is, your mission is, your goals are, if you have a strategic plan for those to be, for you to hire people who do those, people that report to you, people that you can train? Or is it a be better business model to take all the money you have and subcontract it out to businesses across the city? Clearly the first one, because the latter one dilutes your ability to mm -hmm. even control what you're right, doing. Right. When you're ex exclusively contracting and subcontracting out your work, 
You are at the mercy of what each organization's individual priorities are, how they do business. You can't really drive the narrative in that way. And yet for most of our major priorities, that was the case. So I prioritize bringing the first ever Behavioral Health Bureau to the city of St. Louis. I was blessed to be supported by a mayor who shared my vision, who provided me in our first year with 14 salaried positions. Then I had to get innovative without adding a dime to taxpayers' money. Mm -hmm. I went to the CDC using my past relationships, right, and 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 the platform I'd built for myself before coming to this role. And the director of the CDC chose our health department as the first health department to come to um, in her tenure. And she gave me one hour. I said, no, I'm going to need six, please. <laughs> and I took her to North City. Mm. I took her to meet with the CEOs of the black-led, federally qualified health centers who do this work. And I asked her to assist me in building this bureau. She gave us CDC resources and men and women that bought me a year to work with the city to then recruit and to raise my own funds, operational funds. Right. I brought in over $6 million my in funds. The mayor was able to provide us with $2 million through ARPA, and we raised the rest through CDC and state funding. We have put back now in doing listening tours and talking to the people who had done this work before I was even conceived of. There are people who have championed the work of behavioral health, who have earned the trust of their communities, but who struggle because they don't have the same supports. And we ask them, what do you need from your health right. department? If I'm moving into this area, I don't want to step Tell on me. your toes. Tell Where do you me. need me? Mm -hmm. And they told me, we need you to help link people to care. We need you to find us money. And we need you to help us not just find the money, but keep the money. I, I want to ask you a general question in the, in the remaining minutes that we have, and that is... We want, I, I'm making a statement actually, mm -hmm. we want to be well yes. as black people. It's yes. not, because there is still a sense, even among some of us, that, you know, you are obese because you just can't stop eating. You are acting out because that's just who you are. Your mama did that. Your daddy did that. Yeah. We, 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 are, we put all kinds of things on top of what you've already established as historic and willful neglect. But in our own minds... It's almost like there's a battle in our own minds to see ourselves as worthy of good health. Yes. Am I and right? That you are not just right, you knocked it out the park. And that is why mental and behavioral health must be a priority. Because for many people in our community, what do you prioritize, Carol? Do mm -hmm. you prioritize keeping the lights on? Right, right. Do you prioritize going to work every day? Mm -hmm. Do you prioritize looking for modes of transportation to do so? Mm -hmm. Do you prioritize finding food? I haven't even mentioned healthcare yet. Right. So for many people, healthcare doesn't even, if they're being really honest, if they really break it down for you, healthcare is in the forefront of their minds. Mm -mm. So I can list. understand how as a society, um, we don't think to advocate for more funding and resources to go to the public health department because you don't see it as a, an, an urgent priority in your life. But how do you go to work if you're sick or dead? Mm, How do you girl. take care of your kids if yeah. you are sick or dead? Mm -hmm. So while it is not the most easy to see priority, it's so much easier to rise up when, bang, someone dies right outside on, your, on the corner of your right. street. That's something that we can easily fight. It's harder to fight, right, keeping your blood pressure down, mm -hmm. making sure your mental health, health is okay, going for a walk because it helps with your physical health, but it helps with your, your mental, mental too. Mm -hmm. That's not as easy for people to grasp as as urgent a priority right, as somebody getting shot and, on and, their street. And that we're trying to grasp it in the midst of, we want you to grasp That's it right. in the midst of the, all, all the trauma right. that, that you are facing. And so, so it's my job to bring public health back to the fore. The reason why I'm big on communication, increased community, uh, com community engagement with our department by mm -hmm. 300% in my first four months is because it's my job to make health care accessible, public health accessible, mm -hmm. normalize having these conversations, right. make it easy for people to understand where the resources are. Right now, any behavioral health need you have, we have given you a number at my health department, an email address that somebody will call and we will do the work for you. I have a small but mighty team of people who have spent an entire time mapping out resources in the city. They can link you to care. So it's going to take time, Carol, but it started with the vision of a mayor mm -hmm. who then made it a priority to bring in unapologetic leadership that does the same. And then it takes time. But the fact that you care enough mm -hmm. to bring someone like me on to one of your inaugural podcasts, right, to talk about public health, we haven't seen that before. No. So I have hope that the tide is turning mm -hmm. and that 
um, we will all use our positions to not only make public health and, and health care something that is at the fore my, forefront of all of our minds, but at the forefront of those people who have the power to move the needle, whether it be policy or funding. How are you going to take care of your children if you are sick or dead? That is a phrase that will resonate in my head for a long time. You, you have to come back is the bottom line here. So I, I I think I need a quarterly visit. Listen, with you, you so don't have can, to. You don't have to tell me twice. I'll be here with bells on anytime you ask. She's coming back. She is coming back. Thank you so much. And in twenty twenty four, I know that you have you you, you are a goal oriented woman, um, and one of the goals is her hunk of a husband. <laughs> I have that same goal, my hunk of a husband. Period. Uh, we, lo- we love that about each other. Period. Um, because family's everything yeah. and a healthy relationship. I And I will say healthy relationships are, are everything. And that's yet another topic, yeah. um, trying to have those in the city of St. Louis. Uh, but I talk about my husband because I want people to know that black love is real. So real. It's real. Oh, and they get on and our it's nerves. Possible. Oh, sometimes, yeah, that don't make it. Sometimes that. we can't stand each other. It's I, still black love, though. I did not say it's Hear perfect. That. Thank you. Did not say it's perfect <laughs> at all. But it is real. But it's ours. But and it it's is real ours. And it is so beautiful. And we and 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 we are worthy of that yes. as well. Of your 2024 a goal. I know you have many. What what before we let you go? What's that? Personally. Um, it's okay to say no. Mm. Professionally, uh, I need people to be aware that right now the things that are really impacting our city, maternal child health was, we were at the top, bottom five states in the country and our numbers are up higher. So we need to prioritize mothers and babies. Mm -hmm. Um, Sexually transmitted infections have been skyrocketing. Um, since before the pandemic and ballooned in the city, specifically syphilis. Mm -hmm. Congenital syphilis is something I never used to see as an ID doc. It Mm -hmm. is back, Mm -hmm. and it has increased over 600% Mm -hmm. in the last seven years. And um, lastly, like I said, mental health and behavioral health. It's okay not to be okay. It's okay to look for help. If you think you're going to hurt yourself or hurt someone else, 988 is the number to call. We grew up with 911. We now have 988. And 988 is for when you do not feel safe. And it's not a criminal thing. It's not a police thing. It's a mental health thing. And someone will get to you right away. If you are not in that acute crisis and you still need services, you still need to know where to go, who you can see, where help can be found, um, then you call my health department. My my behavioral health bureau has got you. 314-657-1000. We got you. Thank you for the work you are doing. Uh, We respect you so much, and we are fortunate to have you in the city of St. Louis. Dr. Davis, thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining us on another episode of Listen St. Louis with Carol Daniel. You can share this. We do hope that you subscribe, and we do hope that you download this podcast because maybe you can't listen to the whole thing right now, but download it and listen to it later. And you can find all of our previous podcasts at 9pbs.org. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you again. Listen, St. Louis with Carol Daniel is supported in part by Midwest Bank Center, the Betsy and Thomas Patterson Foundation, and Orvin and Latrice Kimbrough. 